conversation and uh, and at some point we'd love for you to uh, to chip in and tell us what uh, what you want and what you think and your questions and so on and so forth and Sasha it's good to see you again you um, we saw each other a few months ago at the Logan uh, symposium in California, uh, in California UC Berkeley, exactly. UC Berkeley which was a, this group of journalists investigative journalists who come together once a year to talk about important issues and I am um, I am honored to uh, be in this conversation with you uh, for a lot of reasons. But before I do anything, Sasha, I'm going to get the question out of the way that everyone in this room is asking and they're thinking, and it's going to get out of the way. What was it like? Well, uh, McAdams, Rachel McAdams, <laughs> playing Sasha Pfeiffer. Not, you go ahead, tell me what it was. Uh, you know what I always tell people is that what I really love about our business is it gives us access to all sorts of places that other people don't get access to, right? The, the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. That experience let us get behind the curtain of Hollywood. That was really interesting. I mean, we saw them being made up by their many, many people work to make those people very beautiful, right? Many people work on the hair and the makeup and the clothing. And we saw them prepare for a part. You know, most people only see these actors on the red carpet. We saw them studying and spending time with us. In fact, a, a story that I often tell is that when the movie came out, I remember my brother said to me, she does that thing you do with your thumbs. And I was like, what are you talking about that thing with my thumbs? And he's like, you know, you're always going like this. And I realized that not only did they depict our mannerisms, but they also depicted mannerisms we, they, we didn't know we had. Because all the time we spent with them, they were studying us and dissecting us and observing us. And there was a weird period of my life where we kept having dinners with movie stars. And it, to me, it felt social. And I realized later for them, it was work. How, how much time did she spend with you? Uh, tell me to get that down. That takes a... Uh... I mean, she made multiple trips to Boston to visit, and we were invited to be on set a lot. The director was very wanted to get everything right, so he said, come as much as you want when we're filming, which meant we spent a lot of time with them, and enough time for them to really pick up on even subtlety. This was the glamour of it, but you, you folks were focused on a very, very serious topic that was watershed in terms of uh, its impact on uh, Catholicism, its impact on the way people view religion. In fact, it's impact on journalism. And I'm just wondering, can you talk a bit, Sasha, about the, um, the abuse scandal itself? The, uh, and when I ask that, I'm not asking for a broad overlay because it would take us all day. Uh, but I, I am asking, when you this topic was first introduced, the notion of exploring the Catholic Church in a critical way was seen almost as uh, sacrilegious to use a, a, a religious term. Yeah. And I'm wondering how did, when this was, um, when you were approached about this topic as, as part of this investigative team, what were your thoughts and were you concerned about how it might impact uh, your relationships with your uh, family in South Boston, for example? Mm. So the way the story came about, which some of you may know, is that I was on the Spotlight team. The Globe had a new editor, Marty Barron, the recently retired editor of the Washington Post, came to town. Uh, Marty was Jewish, which is relevant because the Globe had never had a Jewish editor. And the Globe was um, often thought of as being a combination of too deferential to the Catholic Church. And sometimes people said we were anti-Catholic. So there had been these sporadic cases of priests molesting children. There's a very infamous one involving Father John Gagan, who had been cycled among six parishes over 30 years. where He kept abusing kids. Parents kept complaining. Oftentimes they would be told, we're so sorry that's happening. Please take a check, sign this confidentiality clause. And Father Gagan would have transferred to another parish where he kept abusing people. He eventually got criminally charged and that entire case got sealed by the court. No one could get access to it. And I'm embarrassed to say the Globe never questioned that seal. When Marty Barron came to town, he said, why is this case sealed? And the reason he did that is there was a longtime Globe columnist named Eileen McNamara. And she had written a column about this. And the last line said something like, and the public will never know. And, and Marty said, well, we actually, we could know if we get the case unsealed. So he sent our lawyers to court, the Globe's lawyers, to try to unseal that case, which took months and was successful. But in the meantime, he asked the Spotlight team to try to figure out, is this really just a case of one bad apple, as the church said, or could this be a more systemic problem? Now, we thought, how many priests can there really be that abuse children? That seemed like, how, how common can it be? We now know it was incredibly common worldwide for a lot of reasons that we can talk about or not talk about. but. I, we actually were very fearful that when we published our first stories, the Globe might be picketed. We thought that it would, it would just be in this very, very traditionally Catholic city. We would be further accused of 
of being anti-Catholic. And the opposite turned out. I think that I think that over the years, for many reasons, Boston and society in general became much less deferential to the Catholic Church. And by the time it came out, and there was also so much, you know, we were able to unseal records that by opening the church's own file cabinets showed you without without doubt what had been happening. And so I think that there was so much evidence that you couldn't even blame the messenger if you were inclined to. But um, my mother is extremely Catholic, so Catholic that she still goes to daily mass every day when she can. And I always Lithuanian tell Lithuanian Catholic, right. exactly. I mean, my mom wanted to be a nun. My mom was that generation that carried a rosary in her pocket. And I, I tell people that there was a very loud silence when that story came out. And, you know, to this day, my mom and I have never talked about it in huge detail because my mom still goes to mass every day. You know, there were many Catholics who decided they wanted nothing to do with the church anymore. Others joined groups like Voice of the Faithful that tried to reform the church. And people like my mom kept going to church. Every day. And so I've never really wanted to get into an in-depth conversation with her because I feel like she was kind of a generation of Catholic that uh, was unquestioning. Um, I had a, a, also a very Catholic grandmother. And I remember she said to me, she said, we all thought the priests were little gods. And I remember thinking, that's why this happened. Because when you think someone's a god, you don't ask questions and you don't question authority. And part of our job is questioning authority. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, it definitely played out in my family as well. And I cannot begin to uh, express... Wanted to be a nun. My mom was that generation that carried a rosary in her pocket. And I, I tell people that there was a very loud silence when that story came out. And, you know, to this day, my mom and I have never talked about it in huge detail because my mom still goes to Mass every day. You know, there were many Catholics who decided they wanted nothing to do with the church anymore. Others joined groups like Voice of the Faithful that tried to reform the church. And people like my mom kept going to church. Every day. And so I've never really wanted to get into an in-depth conversation with her. Because I feel like she was kind of a generation of Catholic that uh, was unquestioning. Um, I had a, a, also a very Catholic grandmother. And I remember she said to me, she said, we all thought the priests were little gods. And I remember thinking, that's why this happened. Because when you think someone's a god, you don't ask questions. And you don't question authority. And part of our job is questioning authority. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, it definitely played out in my family as well. And I cannot begin to uh, express to uh, many of you young people, just how uh, iconoclastic this was. I cannot begin to express it. <clears throat> the power of the Catholic Church is exemplified in so many ways. It's so, it's so uh, uh, such a power that I can still remember Latin from my youth, and I haven't been a Catholic in many years. Confidi de mi potum te beate Maria et my virgin name. I can, I, it is ingrained. I remember uh, so much of it. And that beginning scene, I just want you to talk about that for just a second. The, that beginning scene where you see the priest going into a police station, I mean, being escorted from a police station, which I assume is Gagan. Um, and um, um, in fact, I know it was Gagan. That was a powerful scene because it also showed the, the symbiotic relationship between two institutions, the police and the Catholic Church. And they were rubbing each other's backs. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that throughout, you know, throughout Boston's history, the church was protected in a lot of ways. And, you know, today we've seen the decline of so many institutions that used to be anchored, right? People have no very little respect for government. They're disgusted with corporate America. Um, people don't have, think the Supreme Court doesn't have integrity. The church used to be one of those anchor institutions. And I think that, you know, many people will say the loss of that anchor is, has been a bad thing for society, but it also meant that police, prosecutors often look the other way. You know, one of the things that changed after our reporting is you may know that there are these things called mandated reporter laws, where if you're, say, a social worker or a teacher and you find out a child's being abused, you must report it. Religious people who worked in the religious settings were exempt. You know, priests... You could be a priest and be told something. If, if, if you learned that a, if a priest learned that a child was being abused, there was no mandated reporting law. If a nun learned, if someone who worked at a church learned, now they are mandated reporters. But I think that's also an example of lobbying efforts probably to make sure that priests were exempt from mandated reporting. And we saw that, that people accommodated those requests over time. The fact that the, file, the Gagan file got sealed, I think, is a sign of the church's um, over-deference to the church. So... You know, I think it's, um, I don't think a lot of folks necessarily wake up one day and say, I want to be an investigative reporter. I mean, it could be. Uh, that could be the case. But I'm just wondering your trajectory of, was it uh, 
journalism or was it something else that led you to the Boston Globe Spotlight team and now to National Public Radio? So I, I think I knew as early as at least high school that I just wanted to be a reporter. I thought it'd be the most interesting job in the world. It's like, but investigative report? Well, not initially. Initially, I thought I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. And then I realized that a foreign correspondent lives the life of a nomad. You, right. you move around That's a what lot. I to do. <laughs> You're very unanchored. And eventually I decided I think it'd be better to not work overseas, but but reporting in general gives you a lot of opportunities to travel. I had a trajectory that used to be very common for people who wanted to be a reporter and is harder now, which is that I got a job at a little weekly newspaper at the Dedham Times when I got out of college. I didn't major in journalism. I majored, I was a double major in English and history. I felt like college was my last chance to do some intensive reading and writing, and I could get training at a paper. And I did. And then I, I had a lot of ideas for stories that my paper wasn't interested in because they only wanted stories about Dedham. But I was seeing stories that were happening in Denham that were happening elsewhere. So I started to pitch stories to the Globe, which at the time had these suburban zone sections, West Weekly, North Weekly, Northwest Weekly. And I started writing for West Weekly. We covered something like 35 communities west of Boston. I loved it. I worked out of the Globe's Framingham Bureau. I did that for about four years. Then the Globe hired me to cover the court system, which I loved. I worked out of Suffolk County Courthouse, where there's a drama in every courtroom. I loved it. And then, after a few years of that, Walter Robinson, Robbie, who was played by Michael Keaton in the movie, became the editor of the Spotlight team. And he was assembling a team of reporters, and he came to me because I had a lot of experience covering the legal industry, the courts. I knew how to read court records. And, and he was trying to think about how do you assemble complementary skills. Matt Carroll, who was on the team with me, it was, a, was a big data guy. Mike Resendiz, who was on the team with me, had a lot of political skills. So Robbie looked for complementary skill sets and things we all knew that could assemble a powerful team that could cover a lot of areas. And I actually debated whether to take Robbie up on his offer because mm -hmm. I loved covering the courts. And I had only been doing it for about two or three years, and I felt like I had several years left in me. But ultimately, I decided when you get asked to go on Spotlight, you go on Spotlight. Thank goodness I did because That's I right. would have missed out on the biggest project it ever did. That's <laughs> right. That's yeah. right. Um, the Pulitzer Prize was the result. But also, uh, the movie itself won an Oscar. It was an incredible year, uh, and even though there's adulation, there must have also been pressure uh, of various sorts. Uh, can you talk about the pressure and how it manifests? Well, so the, the, the stories came out in early 2001, and then it became this gigantic story that involved the archdiocese almost declared bankruptcy, cardinal law, it's resigning. So we covered that for about a year and a half, two years. So I think the Pulitzer came in 2003. 2003. The movie right. didn't come out until 2015. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing Annie said, I think Annie said, I was at the Globe from 95 to 2008. I was also at the Globe from 2014 to 2018. I left in the middle to work for WBUR. Sorry, I missed that. Oh, it's okay. and I, wanted, I, wanted, I want to point out somebody else in the room. My former wonderful WBUR colleague, Bruce Gellerman over there. Bruce, I consider one of the most talented people in public radio. Without question. Bruce had one of my favorite voices. He the most memorable stories. And so, and I, I probably will end up asking Bruce questions tonight because I had the experience of transitioning from print to radio, which I naively thought that all you do is you write a newspaper story and you read it out loud. <laughs> and radio is a very different animal. But the reason I mention this is because there was a 12 year gap between when we did the stories and when the movie came out. And I had had this whole almost other career in the middle. I had moved to public radio. I was a reporter and then I became a host. And suddenly a movie was being made about something I had done a decade earlier. And it was a very strange experience. Do any of you know Meredith Goldstein, who writes the Love Letters column? So Meredith wrote a book, and it was centered around this big breakup she had had that made her sort of just re-examine life in a lot of ways. When she wrote the book, the breakup had happened years earlier. But when the book came out, people kept saying, oh, Meredith, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, that's ancient history. It was just book fodder. So for me, it was a very strange experience for people to want to talk about these details of the reporting when it had been a decade before the movie. I, so, I'm, I'm so glad you talked about the transition, or actually, you really haven't, but I'm going to ta ask you to talk about the yeah. transition. To go, from, um, to go from print journalism and the type of print journalism you're doing, this investigative deep dive, and you then go to public radio, to an exemplary station, WBUR, our competitor, but <laughs> <laughs> an exemplary station, of, and very talented. You're, you're spot on about Bruce. I've known Bruce for years. Uh, super talented. And so I'm just wondering, that adjustment, how, how, did, you, how did you do it? What were the mechanics? Of, uh, and I'm thinking <clears throat> psychologically, and I'm thinking in terms of uh, adapting to audio as a journalism form. 
coming from the globe to mm. BUR. So first I want to tell you why I left. So I came in 1995 and in 2008, so the globe was bought by the New York Times in 1991. Does that sound right? Uh, Anyone remember so. how much the New York Times bought the Boston Globe for? Do you happen to know? Like a billion dollars. A billion yeah. dollars. In, night, in 2008, the New York Times wanted nothing to do with the Globe anymore. We were just, the newspaper industry was collapsing. The Globe was losing money. It put us up for sale. And it looked for a while like a hedge fund might buy the Globe. And we all know what happens when that happens. Does anyone, so ultimately, John Henry, the owner of the Boston Dead Sox, bought the Globe. Does anyone remember what John Henry bought the Globe for? 89. About 70 or so? Yeah. Oh <laughs> New York Times bought it for a billion dollars and sold it for 70. Right. So I saw the globe get put up for sale and I thought this place I thought I wanted to work forever. I'm not sure is a, is a place I can work forever, but I wanted to stay a journalist and I wanted to stay in Boston. And I looked at the landscape and I thought I'll, I approached mm. BUR. I thought I could learn broadcast. So I truly thought you just write a newspaper story and you read it out loud. Right. <laughs> so can I just Bruce, is that what radio is? <laughs> no, you came with so much more. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, this genuine person born for the US, he wanted to become a reporter. He was insatiable curiosity, his openness, and driven by story. And so everything else fell in place. Extraordinarily talented. And, and, I, and one of the questions I, I really had for you, I was going to ask tonight, was, was how I watched you do that transition. It was very uncomfortable. I mean, because well, I show up and they gave me a kit, right? And I honestly, I was like, kit? What is it, a kit? And I unzip the little bag and there's a microphone. And I was like, oh, I have to interview with a microphone. It's going to be very awkward. Cords, batteries, adapters, headphones. And I thought, this is going to be really awkward that I have to now try to make people comfortable. And now I have to have on headphones and a microphone. I mean, it was just, it was a shock. And then they, Monica Brady Myrov, one of our formal, oh, former yeah. colleagues, was Monica. given, she created a training schedule for me. Voicing, tracking, writing. Um, you know, I, I've often told the story. So I began as a health science medicine reporter. And the first spot I ever did, a spot in radio, sometimes called a rap, is about 45 seconds. It's what you hear at the top of the newscast in public radio. My first spot was about one of the big hospitals in Boston, maybe the Brigham had done what is euphemistically called a wrong site surgery. You want to guess what that is? In general, what's a wrong site surgery? Amputate the wrong limb. Yep. They were supposed to operate on the guy's left ankle, and they operated on his right ankle. <laughs> so, so he comes out of anesthesia, wrong limb, right? So it was a big deal, and I had to spot it. So I interviewed the vice president of healthcare quality for the Brigham for probably 45 minutes. I knew the history of medical errors. My first draft of my spot was eight minutes long. <laughs> it's basically a documentary, right? Mark Degon, I heard, he said, it's a spot, it has to be 45 seconds. And I remember saying, every piece of information at eight minutes is indispensable, I can't make it shorter. And he's like, 45 seconds. So I trimmed it down to four minutes, which is a generous radio feature. And Mark Degon said, 45 seconds. By the time I was done, it basically said, uh, my name is uh, Sasha Pfeiffer. The, the Brigham messed up. Left ankle, right ankle. Family's upset. Here's a quote for WBUR Sasha Pfeiffer. <laughs> and I remember that. I remember that night feeling like, what have I done? I was on the spotlight team. We did intensely detailed reporting and writing, and I just did a children's book version of the guy's ankle surgery, right? But I learned that the ability to learn to distill information to that level is incredibly valuable. What was a Mark Twain quote? I would have written a shorter letter if I had more time. Right? Yeah. You have to really learn how to think what is the absolute most important thing? How do you crystallize it? How do you distill it? The nice thing now, particularly about NPR, is we can do many different versions of our stories. I can do a four minute version for All Things Considered a Morning Edition. I can do a 15 minute version for the Consider This podcast on All Things Considered. I can do a 30 minute version for Up First Sunday, which is the morning edition podcast that's long on Sundays. So there's a lot of different options, but radio still requires ultimate simplification. Oh, let me, I'm, I'm going to applaud you. Oh, and here's why uh, because I've seen a lot of people transition from one form and to another television into radio, right into, uh, into radio, so on and so forth. Uh, and oftentimes, what they bring uh, is, I'm not budging from my 
from my former <laughs> incarnation. You know, I'm not budging from my from my former uh, expertise. And you were willing to a- adopt and adapt. Uh, and I'm and the reason I'm going to give you props for that is because it's hard for a lot of people. Um, when I'm when I left uh, just one radio segment, uh, one type of radio program for another, the world, and went to local uh, to do local radio, uh, they they gave me a nickname, which was Philip Feature Writing Martin, <laughs> because I could not. It was hard to write a, a rap. I mean, Bruce, you know what I mean? It's it was hard to write. The notion of, of, of condensing something into 45 seconds, yeah. 50 seconds, it's it's incredible. Incredible. Hmm? Now 32 seconds. Now, exactly. <laughs> and, and did you feel that you were under pressure from marketers? or uh, Because that was uh, a common uh, assumption within public radio. When the, the shorter piece got, the more it was assumed that this was part of a marketing a study, the result of a marketing process, where where listeners felt more comfortable with 45 seconds or 50 oh. seconds or a minute. Well, I mean, I, I do know they have all these audience, audience insights like committees, and they know. I mean, in the old days, NPR did quite long stories, right? Oh, yeah. Wouldn't it be quite common? People could go eight minutes, um, right? I used to do it. Exactly. With free free. Now right. they probably want the same story in three and a half minutes. Uh, yes. And so yeah. I think that they feel like audience attention is shrinking, which it has, right? And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they're just trying to give the listeners what they want, and listeners don't really want long. But now we have podcasts, which are an outlet for long. But you also have something, uh, uh, what I'm trying to get to is you have something called modesty. Uh, and the, <laughs> and the and reason that's important in, in journalism, of course, uh, is that it's, it's hard for someone to win a Pulitzer Prize, uh, to have been involved in a, uh, a, um, a movie that won an Oscar, and still maintain that I'm just about town person, you know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and 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 I'm going to. I don't want to put you on the spot on that, but I think it is important to ask about the the role of ego in all of this. How do you basically keep it under control? Because look, think about this, Sasha. You not only did you do that, you also transitioned now. I don't know if you've heard Sasha on public radio, but I I listen to her all the time, and you have become a just a fabulous host. Um, talk about that, that milieu of, uh, of, of issues. Well, I think our jobs are, are really hard. I really do. And I think even though I've been doing it a long time, every story feels hard in a new way, mm-hmm. right? How am I going to write this one? How am I going to get this information? How am I going to make this person feel treated correctly? How am I going to, if you're dealing with sort of a belligerent public official that doesn't want to share information. So I feel like every time it's hard. I don't think I, and actually that's what I like about our jobs. Mm-hmm. It keeps us always thinking about a new way to do something always trying to find ideas, which in some ways is the hardest part of the job, finding the ideas, then getting the information, then writing the story, then distilling it in the way radio requires. We now also write digital stories that are companions to our broadcast stories. It's basically like a newspaper story put online. It doubles the workload. But now I have to write a newspaper story as well. And take photographs. And well, we, they, they've had phases where they want us to do that. In reality, <laughs> they usually want the professional. Oh, really? Okay. They right. don't like the yeah. lighting of ours. They don't like That's the right. <laughs> But I, I guess I just feel like these are hard jobs, but they're hard and that's what makes them fun and interesting and such a fun way to make a living. Right. Like most of us have to work for a living. You might as well do it in a way that's interesting and stimulating and makes you feel like you have potential to do some good in the world. And that's what this business potential lets us do, you know, but. I'm going to ask you one more, one other question. And I'm, I'm going to open this up because I'd love for, to hear, hear your questions. And, and are there, New plans, Sasha Pfeiffer. Are you, are you, have, you, have, you, have you thought about what the next phase might be? You know, from Spotlight Team to BUR to NPR as a reporter on the investigative team and now host, what might be next? Right now, I really like my job. I have a combination of reporting and really in-depth reporting where I'm not on deadline every day, which is nice. And I have, I've, I cover Guantanamo and that's become a subbeat. And I love that because it's a fascinating time to cover it. And it, it gives me a chance to do things sometimes a quicker turnaround story than the longer investigative ones. And I host. So it's a great mixture. Um, you, you probably all know that it's been a rough few weeks for the media. CNN laid people off. BuzzFeed laid people off. NPR just announced a hiring freeze. So at New this York point, Times strike. New York Times strike. Exactly. Mm-hmm, yeah. So I feel like, as I mean, right now I feel very content. You know, one thing I debate a lot is what I want to host full time, but Hosting, even though those are very high-profile jobs in radio, 
it, they're very confining. You know, oftentimes you're given three and a half minutes with his politician. Go. And you, you, it's harder to do the more in-depth thing. So mm -hmm. what I have now lets me do in-depth plus the hosting. So I feel like I have a combination that I really like. So for now, I feel content. Props, props, props. You know, one thing I want to add about hosting. So I came to BUR as a reporter. BUR has a show called Radio Boston. The host went on maternity leave. I was asked to fill in on the maternity leave. At the end of that maternity leave, they asked me to become the host of All Things Considered. With every, every, All Things Considered has a local host. I didn't like that job very much because a lot of it is reading headlines and weather reports. Um, and it, you, you, you have a limited opportunity to do in-depth interviews, even though people are hearing you at a really prime part of the day. But I remember when I started hosting, all of a sudden, this, you were basically critiqued on how you sound. I mean, think about poor television mm -hmm. reporters. Poor women are judged on their <laughs> hair, their makeup, and their clothing. But suddenly people were, people, I remember someone said to me, you're pronouncing um, lemon incorrectly. <laughs> how hard is it to pronounce lemon? But I was saying lemon. And they were like, actually, it's lemon. <laughs> and again, I remember thinking, I used to be on the spotlight team. <laughs> <laughs> like, now I'm going to call you about a product station of lemon and right. peanut. They're like, you're saying peanut. It's peanut. I was like, all right. I guess I have to fix that. I remember once um, I used to have to read weather reports, right? And I remember someone wrote me a letter and they said, you are showing bias in your reporting. And I thought, I feel like I'm scrupulously unbiased in my reporting. Well, the person said, when you read the weather report and you say it's going to rain, you sound disappointed. <laughs> and they said, you need to realize that gardeners really appreciate rain. And so why are you sounding so disappointed? And I, 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 first I thought, this is ridiculous. And then I thought, she's actually right, because I'm a bicycle commuter, as we talked about. And when you're a bicycle commuter and it rains, it's just, it's a big bummer, right? And I thought, I need to be conscious of the, what I'm transmitting in my voice. Someone has actually said to me once, they said, um, you sounded angry today with your hosting. And I realized I had been really frustrated that day. And I just went into the studio, rushed and harried. And I think it, it, I sounded probably curt and terse. And I thought, again, you have to find a way to be often authoritative, but also pleasant enough that you don't sound unpleasant. And if you've had a bad day, you have to shake it off when you go in the studio. So I constantly learn things on radio about how you present and how you have to sound. And I like that my job keeps letting me learn. Uh, and, and gravitas. You have to also have, yeah. have gravitas. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I take it back. I, there's one other <laughs> question I have to ask you that's very fundamental. We are dealing today uh, as journalists in the country with this thing that we, many people see as creeping authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a real fear that democracy is under attack in the United States. And as a result of that, there is a debate that has raged <clears throat> within journalism uh, whether to whether the journalists should see themselves as part of that democratic process. There's a question of whether or not uh, you call a lie a lie. There's a question of whether or not you call an authoritarian an authoritarian in the terms that you use and so on and so forth. Um, I saw a, uh, a movie the other day. It's totally not relevant to this. At all. <laughs> but it was um, uh, a Norwegian movie called Troll. And I sort of chuckled uh, in the middle of the movie when this gigantic creature, 500 feet creature, is walking this above the earth. And a reporter who they set up in the piece says, it seems to be a gigantic uh, troll. <laughs> it seems to be. It, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, and the seems to be was actually, I chuckled at that because I've heard reporters say seem to be when something is clearly a lie. I've heard reporters say seem to be when there's a clear threat uh, opposed by uh, uh, ultra-right uh, groups and so on and so forth. And, yeah. and there's a clear threat to democracy. Yeah. What's, what's your view about that? I mean, this, this is all true. I feel very torn about this. And I think many media outlets continue to wrestle with this. Like the lie question. You might remember the Wall Street Journal wouldn't allow them to say lie because he said you have to know that the person intended to mislead and we can't know what a person intends, right? But I, I think what it comes down to, and an editor at NPR said this to me and I think put it well. So a lot, some people at NPR were using the phrase big lie in their own words. It wasn't like what Joe Biden calls the big lie. And I, I was trying to decide whether I felt comfortable doing that. And I talked to an editor who said, he said, the problem is that even if it's true, we end up sounding ideological. That's true. And yeah. so I'm always torn about in this era when there's so much mistrust of the press and, and people really do think we have an agenda. How do we try to avoid sounding ideological? And I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. I feel like we have to keep continually trying to figure it out. Indeed. It's, it, it evolves. Yeah, I think so. Indeed. Um, folks, uh, Sasha Pfeiffer. And, uh, <laughs> Would like to uh, please? You've had your hand up for a long time. Hi, my name is Jillian. Um, I have a question about how 
you approach these really sensitive subjects. Recently, I've been doing a story about like um, abuse on Emerson film sets and like kind of the school's complicity in these film sets. And mm. I'm kind of wondering, well, and this is kind of a two part question of approaching sensitive stories. And I'm also interested in developing a story about sexual abuse in a high school in my hometown. And I'm wondering how you approach these really sensitive issues. Like with Emerson, I'm approaching, you know, students who are my age and, you know, who are my colleagues and my classmates who are going through, you know, these issues on campus. But also I'm kind of talking down about, you know, people, administrators on campus as well who are, you know, not doing their job to what I think is, you know, correctly. And um, so how do you go, like, you went up against the Catholic Church, um, and then also you spoke to people about their, you know, sexual abuse, and you also, sorry, this is, like, so many prompt questions, but also, like, the sexual abuse that I'm interested in looking into, like, it happened years ago. You know, how do you interview someone on something that happened so long ago? Like, it's just as important, especially because I've been told that the person is still, you know, um, that these incidents are still happening. But how do you talk to people who, when this is like forever ago, and then also just how do you approach these sensitive stories about sexual abuse? Because I'm interested in entertainment journalism, and that's a big issue right now. And then just going forward, <laughs> like tackling administration who have the authority against you. Yeah. So there are a lot of questions in there. So, yes, when, right. like, so when you say like, how do you raise it? Do you mean in, in, a, in a sensitive way? Or yeah. if it's... Really, if it happened a long time ago, do you mean how do you make sure the details are correct? And yeah, how do you make sure the details are correct? And how do you even go about bringing that up? You know, like, I feel like I can't just call someone and be like, hey, I heard you slept with this teacher 20 years ago who was, you know, 20 years older than me. Like, how do you kind of go about researching these subjects, but having a sense of sensitivity and modesty and yeah. compassion? This is a case where you already think you have some victims in a sense, you know who they are. Yes. I mean, that, it is always hard to make that first contact, yeah. but I think you have to do it in a, in a sort of broad way. I'm doing a story about, and maybe you could name the teacher. And mm -hmm. if, that, if the person, if something happened, the person will understand what you're talking about yeah. without you having to go into detail. And then it also is tough if you don't hear back to know how, how many times you try, like you don't want to overdo it, but yeah. can you reach out by email? Can you send a text? Yeah. Um, I, I, for things that happened a long time ago, it's also tricky because you are trying to be very sensitive, but you still have to fact check. Yeah. And so you have to find a way to say anything you can share with me that would help validate, whether it's a text message they sent someone expressing upset. That's, an, that's often a very modern way to do things. Did, did you tell anyone? And that can be corroborating, whether it was a text or an email. And then you can interview the person they told. Um, so uh, does, that, does that answer generally? Is there? Yeah. yeah. And then just kind of like the second prompt to that, like what is it like going up against you know, kind of authority figures, like, you know, you went up to the Catholic Church, but like, for me, I'm a senior, I'm getting ready to graduate, you know, I don't really, it's also hard to talk against authorities who kind of hold my future in their hands. Um, so what is it like approaching these kind of authorities, and how do you go about that? Like, that's very brave. Um, I mean, I think you have to have done as much reporting as you can. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the interesting thing about reporting is you're both trying to get information you don't know, right. but you need to be as schooled as possible when you talk to them yeah. so that you'll have a lot of information and, and you'll and you'll gain the respect if they understand that you've done your homework. Yeah. So I think you go in as armed as possible mm -hmm. with information and knowledge. And and then hopefully you might have the as far as have to hold it there, I'm holding your future in their hands. I mean, I think you hope you have a strong editor backing you. And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the student papers do have that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, uh, please. Um, so you talked a little bit about the difference between kind of the in-depth reporting that you did for Spotlight and radio journalism. Um, were there any like similarities that you saw or any ways that you saw your in-depth reporting help you when you entered radio journalism? Well, I think if you're going to do the job well, the reporting has to be just as in-depth for a newspaper or a radio report. It's just that the radio report often gets more simplified, at least for what airs. If you also do a digital story online, it will be as detailed as your, as your story. I think all the fundamentals are the same. It's more in the presentation. And also Bruce knows this, radio writing, you know, when you're reading a newspaper story, if you had a really complicated, dense paragraph with a lot of clauses and, and uh, just a lot of details, you can read it over and over again until it sinks in. With radio, you have one shot, right? If you use a funny sounding word or a word that might, uh, that, that might, you know, 
what is it a homonym? Is a homonym something that is the same word that means two different things? It sounds the same, but might be spelled differently. Yeah. Yes. You can confuse someone's ear. So oftentimes when you're writing with radio, you have to make sure you don't do something that briefly throws the per- off, person off and distracts them. Because if you lose them for even 10 seconds while their mind wanders, they've lost a lot of your story. So the writing, and it's also, I think of it as more of a subject, verb, object, period kind of writing. It's um, part of the reason I left BUR is that I worried it might be eroding my writing muscles because it was so simplistic. I started to worry, can I still do something complicated? I, 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 luckily, I learned I could. But it's, it's, but it's also really, um, really good writing reporting is an art that once you can do it, which again, I think Bruce is a great example of. And, and it's, just, um, it's just an incredible art and, and there's a skill to it. So the fundamentals are the same, but I think how you present it is a little bit different. You know what I mean? You, when you write print, you write it for the author. Yeah. You write it for the You write it for it. And much yes. One trick that I've done is that you should be talking to your computer. Yeah. If you're not talking to your computer, you're probably writing. Not as well. And are you doing that to try to hear your sentence? Yeah. yeah. So the meter, the, the emotion, rhyming, the onomatopoeia works well. I mean, all these poetic, it's more poetry. Mm-hmm. Your script can look. Very, it doesn't look you know, neat with commas and this, dot, 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 ellipses, and all the rest. It's, 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 mm-hmm. and, and it's got, and then there's all kinds of stuff. Well, I think that's absolutely right because, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a sense like if you hear sometimes reading and you hear, sometimes when people read, you can hear them talking. Unfortunately, there's a sense that the person's dumb when they're doing that, right? Why does that person need to read out loud as they're reading? In okay. radio, I feel like it's indispensable. You need to hear what you're writing. So I often talk to my screen, say the word out, say the sentence out loud. How does it sound? And if you don't, you might discover during your edit that you have a problematic sentence that you haven't heard yet because you haven't said it out loud. Yeah, I used to do that in a subway before we got telephones and uh, before it, and people thought it was just crazy. You know? I mean, it was, I mean, it was yeah. unbelievable. And any other questions? Uh, please, uh, in the back, in the gray. Um, hi, I wanted, my name's Stella. And I wanted to ask you about um, your time reporting on the courts because I think that's or traditionally was kind of seen as like the shoe into the industry and the, the first job is talking in courts. Um, so what did you like about that? What did you find fulfilling about it? And how did you um, look for stories that were kind of beyond just what was on the docket or what was just in the Yeah. I loved it because I got to work in the courthouse. A lot of reporters are tethered to a chair and a desk in a newsroom. I was in the building I covered. And there was the civil side and the criminal side, right? So I could watch cases and I would every day go through all the civil filings that came in every day. Most of the time there was nothing. But once in a while you'd hit gold. Like, Many years ago, there was a Boston Ballet ballerina who sued the Boston Ballet because they said that they uh, had created an eating disorder. They encouraged they encouraged so much thinness that she developed an eating disorder. I found that from combing through the civil files. Right. Just happened to get there that day. But then I was also looking for larger stories about the legal system, the court system, trends in the courts. Um, And that's that's I like the challenge of trying to come up with both the daily ideas and the bigger, more ambitious ideas. And I, I always debated whether to go to law school. So I found just being in that environment and covering judges and lawyers and, and so many life dramas play out in courtrooms that it was just this wonderful, wonderful beat to cover. I loved it. Actually, my question kind of dovetails right into that. It, the, I mean, having, working on a team where you are solely working on investigative projects like at Spotlight is such a kind of outlier position in the journalism industry. You know, across all the different positions and different beats that you've worked in, how do you deal with and like what has your process been like with your editors, with yourself in terms of you know balancing short stories, long term stories, you know the ebbs and flows, and sometimes like the the time periods after you finished up a big story and you're like, I don't, what do I do next? Right. <laughs> so you mean when I when I'm not when I haven't done investigative work where you yeah. just know. I think that is a reality for every reporter everywhere all the time, right? It's a what have you done for me lately business. You can do something great, but then the next day they're like, what story do you have coming next? Mm -hmm. And you have the daily demands, but you're always trying to think of things that will be more substantial, uh, the more ambitious projects. So I feel like every reporter should probably think like small, medium, long. You have to pay attention to your daily beat, but then you want to try to keep an eye on the trends and the issues that can be something you can tackle. I feel like a lot of reporters are constantly frustrated that they can't get to those longer, more ambitious ideas, but that's the job. It's trying to balance all those those three things. In terms of the, the greatest stories you the stories you like best, I should say, not the greatest, but the stories that really grabbed you. How much did serendipity how much of a role did serendipity play in those stories? In terms of tips 
of hearing something on the streets. Uh, it's such a mixture. I think part mm-hmm. of being a reporter is just paying attention to everything in life, everything you see, everything you hear. Um, you know, uh, Stephen Neer is a mm-hmm. reporter at The Globe. Right. But I haven't seen his byline as much lately, so I'm not sure what he's doing right now. But Steve, I think, is a great example of everything Steve sees is potentially fodder for a story. Mm. And he has the kind of beat that allows him to do almost anything. There was something, um, so I live in North Cambridge near the Arlington line. And a few a few years ago, I don't remember exactly what it was, but these cool signs started showing up on telephone poles in Arlington. And I remember walking by thinking, oh, that's pretty neat. And like a week later, Steve did a story. And I thought, that is so Steve. Like, it wasn't my beat, but even, but I'm not sure it would have occurred to me to do a story on it. And Steve did. So I I think that partly it's pressure because you constantly need stories, but just, and I think it's a reporter. I think people who might be reporters tend to be that way. You find everything interesting, everything curious. And so you're constantly thinking, (coughs) is that a story? And is that something I could write about? Mm -hmm. I was, one reason I asked is uh, years ago, I think I might have mentioned this to Bruce, I'm not sure. Years ago, I was talking to a pediatric nurse, uh, just having a conversation at a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> now, I go to Dunkin' Donuts from time to time just to make a conversation, because <laughs> I hate Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> right. So, but, uh, so I, and, um, and at the end of, we were just talking, at the end of the conversation, she said, you know, something strange happened to me. I had a cop in Rhode Island ask me if I would go into a nail salon, uh, and, and if I could tell the ages of the, of the women the young woman working in the in the nail salon. I said, that's interesting. Why would he do that? He said, because they think they might be traffic <laughs> uh, and uh, labor traffic. Uh, and it turned out that not only, uh, as, she, as she told me, it turned out not only were they underage, but they were being both labor traffic and sex traffic, uh, doing nails during the day and sex work at night. Uh, and that happened only because of this conversation. Uh, that I happen to have in a place that I hated, Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> with a pediatric nurse, and uh, so I, I think that that type of thing is uh, that's what I mean when I yeah. when I talk about serendipity. I think sometimes I, I there were times I've been in social settings with friends, and I I think I actually make my friends uneasy sometimes because I remember once we were at a dinner with some couples, and one of the guys worked for Deutsche Bank, and he started talking about something, and I remember he paused, and he's like, "Are we off the record?" And I thought he's nervous that he can't say what he wants to say. Right. And it's kind of probably legit worry on his part, right? Oh, yeah. But I do find that sometimes you have to, um, because we're allowed to ask so many annoying questions in our jobs that normally you wouldn't do in your personal life, I have a tendency to do that in my personal life, and it annoys people, right? <laughs> and so sometimes I have to, like, check myself and realize, like, if I'm with a friend, they, people don't like to be interrogated. So, you know? But, yeah, you hear things, and you think, am I going to compromise a friendship here if I try to pursue that or I ask more about it? But it's the instinct to just keep an ear on everything. Indeed. <laughs> uh, let me check with Adam to see how, how much time we have. Uh, we have until 7.15, so about 14. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, please. Oh, um, hi, I'm Cassandra. You mentioned um, receiving criticism from like audience members on how you read, and, I was, and also criticism from uh, editors on your length of writing. And so I was wondering how you kind of incorporate criticisms that you get without losing your voice without letting it knock your confidence too much as a reporter? You know, that's a great question because I remember someone at BUR who they, they, they had this person work with a voice coach so much that the person ended up not even sure how to talk, right? Lost. It, it's, a, it's a real, you know, NPR is not trying to erase every quirk out of people's voices, but there are certain things that are, like when I came in, I talk way too quickly. I still do, but at least I slow down the air. Exactly. And I was very staccato. And I think over time I've been able to sort of soften the edges a little bit. Um, I also remember that uh, someone at VR told me they heard me taking breaths on air because you know between sentences you need to breathe. But if you if you're if you're having to read a long paragraph, you can end up sounding like you're gulping on air. And the person told me they heard it, and they sent me to a voice coach. And it turns out there's a trick for breathing silent. So I think there are things like that you can do to help someone on the air without erasing everything they are, you know. Um, but yeah, it's a strange, it's a strange, it's a, it's a strange like uh, of all the ways you're evaluated for your job. It was a very odd one in radio, but it's. I remember someone saying to me, "You're dropping your G's." You know, you know, politicians do that. Um, I thought I don't drop my G's. Uh, I don't say like, but I'm from Ohio, and I realized I would say like I'm thinking. It, I would end it with like E E N. I'm thinking. I'm walking. 
And I realized it was supposed to be thinking, walking, right? Columbus, Ohio. That's right. Yeah. And so I, I had to bring back my G's. And it was little things like that that might just distract the listener and make them think, why is she saying that word in a weird way? Um, but I, I generally would like, you have a tendency to bristle, I think, first when you hear things like that. And then I would try to like calm down and think, is that, an, is that a fair criticism? And if it was, can I fix it? And then it was a way to keep learning in your job. Thank you. Know? you. Look, we'll go to you and then to you, Raph. Um, so my name's Amelia. Hi. Thank you for talking with me today. Um, going back to like your criticism journalism, um, and it was kind of relating to the other question before, but um, how do you know when like a story is worth chasing? And how do you keep up like, I guess, the stamina, the um, relationships with your sources, like through the like many like weeks, months that it takes to write those kinds of stories? Mm-hmm. So my old boss, Walter Robinson, Robbie, I, he, he had this expression where he would say, he would talk about digging dry wells. Once in a while, you pursue a story, you get to a certain point and you think, I don't think we can do this. We might not find people to talk on the record. We might not be able to get records. Um, we may think it's true, but just not be able to prove it. Ideally, you don't want to dig that too deeply in that well so you don't waste weeks. But, you know, you, you evaluate, can, is this an attainable story? And there's sort of a checklist you can go through. Again, will people talk? Are there public records? And so I think it's that process. You spend um, a, some intensive time trying to figure out, is this gettable? And if, if you start to think it isn't, then you might have to bail and do something different. Does that answer that? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I met Robbie for the first time this, this summer uh-huh. at the Logan oh, right. Symposium. What too. a kind human being. Yeah. Just is. a very kind person. Uh, and yeah. and uh, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a relevant point when you're talking about uh, contacts and sourcing and and uh, and dry wells and uh, and wells that aren't so dry. I yeah, mean, maybe maybe relationships with people. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And Robbie was a wonderful boss because yeah. you know our in our our work is so busy that oftentimes you don't have time to work with other people. Robbie was a true mentor who was trying to make younger people better because he knew they were the next generation of reporters. Yeah. And I feel really lucky. I actually have another question. Please. I want to I want to hear Bruce and Philip weigh on this. Another real change for me. And I find this still hard in radio is I oftentimes read these very good print stories where you don't see any quote until like 30 paragraphs into the story. It's just maybe the topic or the, the, the dense nature of it. It's just easier for the reporter to write everything that does not work in radio. You no. can't have a story where you're talking for four minutes. And sometimes it feels a little bit to me like writing handcuffs, like just when you get going. And I have an editor sometimes who will say that copy block is too big. That's the expression, the copy block. She may not have read yet what's in the copy block, but if she sees that it's this big, it's too much of my voice. And I find that difficult because sometimes I could say it better, but I need to go into my tape and find something. I, I'm wondering for the two, and this is for any of you who choose to eventually go on radio, I'm wondering what your tricks are when you feel like you'd rather keep writing because you can do it better, but you're forced to have to vary your voice with someone else's voice. I don't hear it the same way. I, I hear it I, if by being able to use audio sound right either a voice or trains coming winds going right and then layering narrative in, you've you've accomplished twice as much or three times more in the same amount of space so i try to get i try to build stories around audio the other thing is is this notion of story telling it's like you try to tell a story you can do things you can tell a story you can refer to it a print story as a story but it's different right because basically, my sense of radio reporting is in all variations of, of child story, what bedtime story, once upon a time, and that's and that's in the telling and the tone, and you can convey so much in your voice, right? Because that's yet another piece of sound. So again, right into the ear. I I I I, I do. I, I think some some beautiful radio writers can write. Uh, Scott Simon is one of them. Yeah, he can write. He's for four and a half minutes, and you don't hear anything but his voice. Yeah. Right? Because the writing is great, and it's written for the ear, and it's written for the heart, and it's written for the mind, <laughs> and it's beautiful prose. Maybe it's some poetry that's thrown in. But I, I, I just want to deviate something, because one of the, they, I've listened to the words, right? Words have consequence. That's what reporting is, right? Mm-hmm. But listen to you know, he asked about serendipity, which is an extraordinary, insightful uh, way of looking at this, this thing called journalism. Right? 
it, she used the word curiosity, and she used the license. I love that when she said the license of uh, being able to ask all these, you know, what, what was the word you used? The uh, uh, chafing question? Or we had a nice term. Phrasing. Yeah. Annoying. Journalism is like a license to ask all the stupid questions. That's the way I always refer to it, as you can, you know. And so, and so, this is this this is so deep. This is such an amazing conversation. Seriously, I'm I'm thrilled to hear these people talk. But I have another question for both of you that I yeah. hope will help all of you too. So, um. With radio, you both need information from the people you're interviewing, but you need them to say things that you can put on the air. And if you're speaking in jargon, it's never going to work. So I have sometimes I struggle with, especially if you've really schooled yourself in advance the way I told you you need to, then you need to make sure you don't talk so technically that all you get back is technical language, mm -hmm. right? So I remember doing once this story that I thought was just made for radio. There's a problem in many hospitals where there's so many beeping, loud, chirping devices that doctors get annoyed and turn them off. And they've had a few cases where people die because like a heart monitor had been turned off. So an MIT researcher decided, rather than all the chirping and beeping, what if they, the, the, the machines collectively make music? And if something is going wrong, like someone's having a heart attack, that music will get dissonant. Mm -hmm. So the, if it's just music, you can plus, it's not annoying. If it gets dissonant, it will catch the doctor's ear and their nose to problem. I thought, made for radio. Made for Absolutely. radio. Absolutely. Right? Then I go to interview the MIT research. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget this. At one point, he was saying something. And he, he referred to our audio and visual modalities. <laughs> and I stopped him and I said, by audio and visual modalities, do you mean hearing and seeing? And he said, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to throttle him. <laughs> so I'm wondering how the two of you, you're both, you're reporting for information, but you need them to say things that are worth putting on the air. Do you have a trick for getting people to open up in that way? And yes. not talk like the MIT guy? <laughs> yes, well, you got two tricks. One is the hardest thing to do in an interview is not ask questions, listen. Because you're listening at all these different levels, right? She listens. She, she, she could have let modality and you know, blah, blah, blah go by, right? But she, she it picked her up. She knew what she needed. So listening is really hard. The other thing is uh, a lot of times, shut up, right? <laughs> so let them fill the space. Right? You've asked them a hard question. They're they uncomfortable, they may go. People want to be heard. But, 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 you know, what you probably did, what you did do, Sasha, is you said to them, does that mean this and this? What you really wanted, I think, is to, is to rephrase that saying, see and hear. Right? Exactly. But, and sometimes you say, can you say that? I mean, you know, I need it. I, you know, that's why I'm here. I'm not wasting your time. I'm not wasting my time. Tell me, give me it. So I, you know, I can use it. You yeah, know what I? No, you tell well, me. Well, no, I, 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 I'm, you're spot on. What, what I also sometimes do is I get into a conversation with them, as opposed to asking a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get into a conversation. Sometimes they, and they, and oftentimes they revert from being formal to being more informal. And there's, and the, we're still t in the moment. We're still talking about these issues. But their but they, their manner has changed, and when their manner changes, quite often their speech changes, and the and the way and uh, it's it's like in the context of it's like code uh, code of uh, 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 what's the term I'm thinking of uh, code code switching. Oh, no. it's, it's it's like code switching in uh, in in a broader sense, where sometimes you're talking to uh, I was talking to this scientist and I knew. That one of the things that he did on the on the sidelines was he smoked a lot of dope, <laughs> and, and, I, and I didn't I didn't ask him to smoke dope. <laughs> I just asked him to refer to his casual self, and, and, and when he did, it, it was just a lot easier. Uh, going back to their first question about uh, sound and uh, and and copy, I, you know, I, I was thinking about this a lot because I just wrote a magazine piece. Um, a freelance piece for uh, uh, as a challenge because it's something I don't often do for a religious magazine at Duke University, uh, and uh, I just wrote this this piece on uh, something that's called intentional communities, uh, and I was again it's it's in order to keep to keep that part of your brain trained, and so from time to time I'll I'll do magazine pieces, and 
But I did start with the audio. I didn't I didn't start with the concept. I started with a story about this guy who took a red line from uh into Dorchester and how his life had been shaped by uh, this very untethered family uh growing up. And and I sort of started with his audio. So I started in the same way, but I simply elaborated. Uh, and and went into a magazine, uh, a narrative, a magazine style of of uh, processing in order to make this thing, this story that I was writing, make sense. Uh, as far as radio, my what I always do is I will listen to my sound. I will cut uh, what we call actualities, different pieces of sound, and then I will spread it out on the in the same. Uh, audio file. I call it an, uh, an audio file. Now, by the time I finish, I might have one, two, three, four audio files uh, for the same story because I've jumbled them in different orders. And I listen to the sound. And from the sound, I write. And I also create an ambience of file. Uh, and so as I'm listening to the sound, I'm also, uh, so as I'm listening to the, these individuals, I'm, I'm writing, uh, constructing my narrative. And so in this case, as with Bruce, my, my actualities, I'm sorry, jargon, my, the, the, the people I've recorded, they lead and I construct around it. Yeah. Uh, before we get any further, I, you had your hands up, and I'm so sorry that we can go over here. Yeah, I, I know you, have, you spoke earlier, but you had your hands up earlier. Yeah. Can, if you can make it a quick question, then we can, we can go around to everyone else very quickly. Sure. Um, my name is Sujana. Again. Um, so I know you've interviewed a lot of people that are probably less willing to talk about the topics that you're asking them about. Are there any like go-to phrases or body language trips, tips, tricks <laughs> that you've relied on in the past that kind of help help you make these people feel more open and kind of go into those topics? I think sincerity is really the best way. Yeah. That's a hard thing to fake, right? Um, sometimes it's just going to be really hard to get people to talk. Like in the past few months I've been doing some stories about the Paycheck Protection Program. That was the mm -hmm. thing in the pandemic mm -hmm. that gave loans to small businesses. And a lot of people ripped off that program. And so, you know, if, if someone scammed the system, there's almost no chance they're going to talk to me. I mean, so there's sometimes the hurdles are just very high. But um, for people who are like, for let's say a victim, if you want to call it that. I, yeah, I think it's sincerity. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's the main answer. Oh, you, you go ahead and then you go ahead. Um, my name's Hannah. Nice to meet you. Um, kind of piggybacking off of that, as a journalist, when you're covering those kind of like emotionally heavy topics, what are some like, not, not necessarily tips, but like ways that not to separate yourself, but it can be like a lot of emotional weight on you, um, especially covering like a lot of really heavy topics, things like that. So, like, how would you recommend doing that? Mm. I mean, I think I'm pretty naturally resilient, so I feel like I have that edge. But, I, but I, I've also often said, because people asked us when we did our clergy sex abuse reporting, they said, wasn't that depressing? And it was depressing. It's also very angering because I spent a lot of time talking to adult men who were smart, you know, uh, talented, successful, nice looking, and they were just wrecked by something that happened when they were 13 years old. Like they had this awful introduction to sex and it affected them and their relationship for the rest of their lives. And it really made me mad. And I realized that, you know, anger can be very corrosive. Was it John McCain's funeral? Somebody said, remember John McCain had been like a POW, horribly treated, but really rose above it. And someone said, hate corrodes the vessel in which it's carried. Love that line, right? So anger can be very corrosive, but it can also be a motivator. And if you can direct anger in a productive way like to drive you to find out something or to be a better reporter and so i think when you're feeling very emotional or overwhelmed and angry think about the job you have this gift of a job you have to try to change something that was wrong or that was unjust so i think about it as redirecting emotions in a way that can be productive i watched philip cover three deaths three firefighters died right on the beacon of the beacon street that day yeah. and we were there together we that's right watch, and you kind of compartmentalize yourself. I mean, it's the, you didn't lock it out. You, you really hypersensitive, but you allow, you use that as, 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 as fodder for your to get this. Thanks, Bruce. Appreciate that. Yeah.
Yeah, that's, uh, I think, yeah, what he said. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it's also a really good question because I think sometimes we get so in the groove of what we do that we forget the impact of the questions we're asking. I mean, it, I'll go back to clergy sex abuse. We have these men tell us <coughs> things and never tell anyone, not their wives. Mm -hmm. And I would often get to the point where I'd say to them, you know, when you hang up the phone, this might feel really heavy, right? Make sure you have someone to talk to. So I think it's it's a mixture of compassion and trying to gauge how they're doing. And then maybe you need to stop that conversation and pick it up again later. So you're trying to find a combination of being professional and being compassionate, but also getting the information you need. I mean, in the end, you have to have to check the facts. And that can be an awkward thing to say to someone that it's not that you disbelieve what they're telling you, but you need to find ways to verify things that hold. So it's the art, I think, of being compassionate, but getting the information you need so that you know that you can what they're telling you is correct. And that might be done over a period of conversation. We, we had, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Adam and the, the young lady behind Adam. Uh, I'm are we, out of time. Okay, just with the young lady behind you, if, if you will, please. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Crystal. I'm also from Ohio. Oh, are you? Yeah. Where? Where? Uh, England. <laughs> ah. Uh, I'm from Columbus. Bruce went to Ohio State, which I just learned okay. tonight. Uh, that's right. I, I grew up in Detroit, so not too far from you. I have relatives in Plains, uh, in Painesville, oh. Cleveland. That's right. Nice. <laughs> right. And in Columbus. Uh, Columbus as well. Um, so you were all talking about listening. Um, I feel like I like unintentionally tend to like tune people out at times. Um, and obviously like listening is a very important part of reporting. If you find like your mind wandering or like focusing on like the next question you have to ask rather than what like the person is saying, like are there any like tips you have kind of to bring yourself back into the interview and the This happens to you during interviews. Um, I actually haven't done any interviews yet. I'm a freshman, so I haven't had um, much experience. But I just know that sometimes my mind tends to wander, and like I don't even notice it is. Um, so I wouldn't want that to happen during interviews. I mean, do you think it would actually wander during an interview? Probably it seems like not. a different kind of conversation that might keep you. Although the question about how do you how do you listen intently plus think about the next question? Yeah, that's that can be challenging. Well, absolutely. Like I mean, just how I guess do you like? Bring yourself to like focus specifically on what the person is saying. If you like feel that you're having trouble doing that at all, or like again focusing on the next question instead of. We so there's a trick. I have a trick. One is I don't hold. I don't do interviews. I have conversations, which 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 you don't write down questions, right? And you don't prepare. You listen, so you're more attuned. You're not saying yeah, my question. You're my question. The other thing is if you find yourself wondering, the trick is. Repeat what you just heard. Just use the last part of it. It'll pull you back into the conversation. Mm. It'll remind you. It'll give you that mental space to get to where you want to be. It'll buy you time. It's a good idea. I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> think of it as a conversation is, is great advice. You know, you don't want to think of it as a list of questions to get through. Um, mm. You have to be able to deviate and follow a path if something comes up. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean you might not, you might have a list of questions in your back pocket you make sure you need to cover, but that can't be how you think of the conversation. You, you want to think of it as a conversation. That's exactly the way to do it. Yeah. Okay. I'll mention one other thing. <laughs> this cracks me up. You know, when I was first, uh, uh, I was an intern during reporting at a radio station here in Boston. <laughs> and uh, the news director didn't show up. He was reading the news. And so the, uh, the head of the station said, just get in there and read the news. I said, okay, okay. I, I said, I don't know what to do. She said, just get in there and read the news. <laughs> so I just started, she said, just write a copy from the Associated Press. I grabbed a copy. And one of the stories was about uh, the National Oceanographic Institute had discovered uh, some, something in the ocean uh, around, uh, around Cape Cod. And I'm reading this story. Just came in three days in from Detroit. And I said, the Coast Guard reports that 14 different types of orgasms washed up on the beach. <laughs> and I said, that should be organisms. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in that same, in that same newscast, I was reading, again, a few days in from Detroit, uh, that same newscast, I was reading, the, the police report that the man ran naked across the roof <laughs> in Worcester. 
the point here, the point here is that we learn. <laughs> and the point here is that we that which we uh, we get uh, which, which we grew up with, it gets shaped by other things. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, that is your story as well, coming in from Columbus and pronouncing what did you say? I uh, said lemon. Lemon. Peanut. Peanut. Exactly. We're shaped by our experiences, <laughs> and we're shaped by our our. Uh, are, are the jobs we do, and and yeah. and I want to thank all of you for uh, for being here, uh, and for uh, my man Adam for organizing, and mm-hmm. our our gracious host is here. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is, um, a, this is a wonderful business, and you guys are entering it at a more challenging time I mean, than we did. But it's a great business in both in terms of what you can do for the world, and then how you can live your life as your working life. So I'm glad you're interested in it. I hope you will have as wonderful work lives as the three of us have had. Absolutely. You're our future.